Hey, what's going on? It's Bill Burr, and it's time for the Thursday afternoon, just before Friday, Monday morning podcast, and I'm just checking in on you. I'm just checking in on you. Oh, how's it going? How's it going with you? I haven't gone to the fucking gym in like three days. And immediately, immediately, you know, when you get to be my age, you don't go to the gym for three days. You don't stretch your fucking shrivel up like Mr. Magoo. All of a sudden, I'm hunched over. You know, for some reason I'm craving a Danish. (laughs) Oh, fuck. You know, I got to tell you something. My wife, my wife, she's, she has, you know, she's always watching these, these, what's funny about her TV. She either watches the dumbest shit or really great shit, just depending on her mood. You know, sometimes I don't want to think, you know, and other times. She's watching this award-winning shit, right? So this is one of the good times. She's watching the, 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 the smarter stuff. She's, she's watching this TV show, Capote, on Truman Capote. And I've been sort of half watching it or whatever. And I finally sat down and watched they had the director's cut of the uh, pilot episode. It was fucking amazing. And um, just watching it, right? First of all, I guess Truman Capote talked like Droopy Dog. You and I are going to be friends, you know? Kind of has that kind of talk. Don't divorce him. You're going to end up in Westchester by yourself. Um, I can't do it, but the, the, the character is, like, fascinating. And it's kind of like, almost like the original Real Housewives. Like, he somehow infiltrated... Like high society, all these uh, these rich women in New York and uh, their husbands were fucking around. They just sort of accepted it and blah, blah, blah. Forget all that bullshit. What I love about that era, or at least the way they're depicting it, there is something to be said about just fucking giving into your vices and checking out at like 59 or 60. <laughs> I'm sitting there watching this shit. They're all smoking. Like, smoking was like this glamorous thing. They're smoking cigarettes. If you saw these fucking, like, just the the the, the things that they, they put their cigarettes in, the craftsmanship of it, little cigarette cases, and they would take it out, and it seemed like this elegant thing that these ladies were doing. Everybody's boozing. If you got too hysterical, you didn't talk about your problems. Somebody gave you a pill, and then you washed it down with booze. I'm not going to lie to you, man. People used to, it seems, you know, if you go on IMDb pages, you know, if you watch movies from the 50s and 60s, the amount of accidental overdoses when pills started coming around and they were mixing them with booze. But I got to tell you, you just watch them, and it's like they're in a penthouse they're in high society while simultaneously, like, essentially tailgating. They're just getting fucked up. <laughs> the guys are smoking cigars. The ladies are smoking cigarettes. And, and, like, you know, they're drinking, but they're all in, like, these fucking elegant glasses, like martinis. And and I don't know what. I, I, I was always just, I always just drank shit straight. So it just came in a little fucking shot glass or whatever. Or whatever you threw ice in. But anyways, it's a phenomenal show. Demi Moore is in it. Who I grew up with her, man. So I was psyched to see her uh, getting some really good material again, you know. And um, I didn't watch it long enough to know everybody's name that is in it. But it's just like really well done. And uh, it's kind of, it's a good thing to watch with like your wife or your girlfriend. Because there's like, there's something in it for everybody. You know, I get to watch like these unexamined guys eating steaks and fucking around and having heart attacks and shit. And and then I think women like all like the gossip. They like that whole thing. This guy worms his way in and then he just starts writing about their lives and shit. It was like uh, they're not really painting him in in the greatest light, but he's also there's something funny about him. He's like this gay Elmer Fudd. Just so (laughs) just sort of. And then all these rich people loved him because he was talking shit about everybody. And they made like that fatal mistake of like, well, if he's talking shit about everybody, what are you going to do when you fucking leave the room? This guy's going to talk about you. It's really, uh, really well done. So um, 
but that's the one thing like you know i i kind of um it's how i deal with like all the fucking stress and nowadays watching the middle east and fucking these two old men going at it for like the 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 fucking rematch that nobody wants or whatever and the, these are the two best guys we can get it's just fucking horrific unbelievably depressing watching this country be divided and everybody screaming at each other as these corporate cunts are just laughing taking all the money it's depressing. So I sort of live in the past and I watch movies from back then or shit like that. And the one thing that um, I can't escape when I watch it is just how they lived. You know? There was no, it just didn't seem like there was any, I need to cut down on this or cut down on that. You started smoking and you just, you just did it. <laughs> Till you died, you know? You liked steak, you ate it as much as you could. You liked to drink, you just walked around like fucking half in the bag. I mean, I know I'm kind of glamorizing, you know, they over, overly dramatize this stuff, but it just looks, it, you know, I don't know. I'm just looking at going like, uh, you know, there's the other side of living clean and fucking eating green and all of this shit and whatever the fuck you're supposed to do and live into 90 and then there's another one it's just like fucking turning 20 and and just partying for like 29 straight years <laughs> you know and then you, you just fucking collapse one day as you're putting on your fucking button down shirt with your initials on the sleeves you know, there's, you know, it's all how you want to do it. There was definitely no intervention back then. Or sort of rules. You could have a fucking two, three martini lunch. Come back with booze on your breath. And if you had booze on your breath, your boss, I guess, thought you did business. Oh, he must have been whining and dining somebody. To make us some more money. That's fantastic. Here's a company car. All right. I'm getting a little too crazy with this. Making it seem like it was that easy. But that was, uh, I don't know. Put it this way. The way it's depicted in movies and TVs back then. And whenever they do something like this Capote thing. But um, Capote is a, uh, you know, it's it's a, uh, it, it's one you can watch with your wife. I'm not going to lie to you guys. You know, for straight guys out there, there's a really uncomfortable steam shower scene that, you know, I had to kind of fucking roll over on my side and put, you know, make one of those, you know, you make a head sandwich with the pillows. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely had to do that at one point. I'm like, God damn, all right, I get it. I get it. Jesus Christ. It was his basic instincts for gay people. My God. <laughs> I actually had empathy for gay people. Like, gay people, anybody gay listen to this shit? Like, what do you, what, back when they had all, like, those fucking Michael Douglas movies in uh, nine and a half weeks? Oh, my, did you guys just, like, avoid them? Like, Jesus Christ, straight sex. Oh, my God, yuck. <laughs> um, put on the crying game, for God's sakes. All right, anyway, it's just interesting. So, uh, all right, I'm joking around. I'm being a fucking idiot here. Uh, sad day, man. Just a fucking sad day for stand-up comedy. The great Richard Lewis, I found out, you know, a couple hours ago, passed away, man. Fucking brutal. Just brutal. Um, I got to go back to the first time I saw him. Uh, the early days of Cable. And I don't know what stand-up show he was on. He had a special that came out. And even if it wasn't in New York, I just knew he was a New York guy. And it was just, it was, he's like, was a major um, link or a bridge from an old, older school way of doing stand up to this newer way. Like, it was like that next thing past George Carlin type of thing. Um, he was on stage, you know, it was like, Post Saturday Night Fever and the Bee Gees and all that. It was like early 80s. So the disco thing was over, but he still had this great long hair. He had the cool fucking clothes, you know, the big fucking, I don't know, boots or the, 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 those shoes or whatever. Like, it, I mean, even like what was so cool about back then was shit could be cool. It had a chance 
to be different because we weren't all plugged in with each other. That was kind of the thing I feel kind of sad for young people is like scenes can't develop because everybody is just filming them in real time. Where back in the day, like, you know, if you lived in Massachusetts, you had no idea what people were doing in fucking two towns over. Forget about a couple states away. And these scenes would marinate and these artists, music, whatever, comedy, actors or, 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 or anything would, would just grow out of it. And eventually, you know, the suits would come around and figure out how to market it. And then the rest of the country would see it. And um, I felt like when I first saw his that first special that I saw that he did, I, his, his just his New York vibe and everything, I was just like, and looking at his clothes, and I didn't understand a lot of the stuff that was going on. But back then, you were like, fuck, man, I want to, what is that? I want to go to New York. I would, and, and I got to be honest with you, like, show business was a million miles away, light years away when you lived in the middle of the suburbs of Massachusetts. It just wasn't the way it was. You know, it was three fucking channels. Like, you know, you'd see Johnny Carson live from Bur beautiful downtown Burbank. These places, it was like going to the fucking moon. It was so far away. So even dreaming of being a, uh, a stand-up comedian in a lot of ways was like saying you wanted to be a fucking astronaut. So, but still, you know, as a kid, you would like think that stuff. And I remember just watching his special and thinking just how funny he was, how cool he was. And then the stuff that I didn't get, I was kind of like, I wonder what he was talking about. And I would hear other people just dying laughing. So I knew it was me. And um, and just that whole, just was a completely different style from anything that I had watched. And I immediately became a huge fan of his. And, and then I could tell by the people's shows that he got on you know, everything from Gary Shanley to Larry David, like they were all like comics, comics, and they always would have him on or Jerry Seinfeld would have him on and comedians in cars and they would talk about the old days and you just knew, you know, the respect that everybody had for him. But um, if you guys, probably the best interview I ever saw um, of him, because he was always mysterious to me because I never met him. And, you know, he was one of those guys, you know, he did his act and stuff like he did his acting stuff, but he wasn't like always like, you know, like some of these, he wasn't like a whore always having to be out there and talking about himself. He would just kind of do what he did and then leave, you know? And, uh, he did an interview with Dom Irera, Dom's podcast, like live at the laugh factory. And there was something, I think just because him and Dom went way back that his guard was way down further than, uh, I had ever seen it. And it was for me and being such a big fan of his, it was an absolutely riveting interview just to get a little bit of an insight onto uh, into him a little more of like what he thought and how his brain kind of worked and his feelings about things. But um, just a, a huge, huge loss, him passing away, but... Um, what he left was an incredible impact in a great way on stand-up. So rest in peace to uh, the great Richard Lewis, man. Um, really, really, really sad. So anyway, um, there's that. And now back to the comedy. Um, I, did a, uh, I did a benefit last night and I got to do my act again. And I swear to God, I feel like I got like fucking two hours of material just going through this period. Just It's just fucking, I don't know, pouring out of me. And I was walking around yesterday and I am like, I am so fucking angry and I have no idea why. <laughs> I just couldn't put my fucking finger on it. I'm just like... Just shit was just making me, I was just snapping. I haven't done that in fucking years. I was just, Jesus Christ, like everything was just driving me up the fucking wall. And I knew I was doing it and like I literally couldn't stop. And I was just, I had to finally just fucking sit down on my back porch and go, what the fuck is going on with me right now? Um, and I'll be honest with you, I still haven't figured it out. <laughs> 
And at my age, I'm starting to think I don't know that I, I, I ever am going to. Um, <clears throat> but, you know, there's a part of me that feels like just because I, I, I just sort of take it out on inanimate objects. Whatever the fuck it is that's driving me nuts, I have no idea. But anyway, yesterday I got to do some, some really cool shit. I got to fly a couple of helicopters that, um, I mean, two of my favorite helicopters, I got to fly... An A-Star, which is the one that the police and uh, the news guys fly. And, oh, my God, taking off in that thing was just, uh, first of all, what I loved is now that I fly the, the, the Cabri, is it's not all backwards from the Robinson. The main rotor turns the same way as mine, so the inputs on the feet are the same. So I was able to lift it up. You know, I fortunately, uh, obviously I had a co-pilot and she was, you know, just, you know, top shelf pilot, right? So I felt safe doing this thing. I mean, it's a fucking really expensive helicopter. And uh, anyway, um, just did a quick flight, like a 10 minute flight, sort of like a demonstration thing, you know? It was this helicopter expo that was in town down in Orange County, which I think wrapped up today. I'm not sure if it's here all week or whatever. But I got to fly that thing and the sh fucking power of it versus what I've flown the entire time I did it. It was unbelievable. And my co-pilot, she was saying like, you know, you really, you know, you only like half power. Like this thing can like haul ass and like the balance and the tracking of it. It was like, it was just smooth as silk. And, you know, I knew that was going to be a problem. I was like, why did I fly this thing? Because now I'm going to go back to mine. And I'm going to feel like I'm flying a fucking egg beater. But it was just, um, it was incredible. And we flew down to uh, Fullerton because we were going to the, the helicopter expo in Orange County. And when we landed in Fullerton, they had an EC-130, which is sort of like the, uh, they were saying like the SUV of helicopters. First of all, it just looks badass. It looks like a fucking like a beetle, like a bug, some sort of insect. And it's really wide and fucking squat. And it sits like three across and I think four in the back. And I'll give you some advice. If you're ever taking a helicopter tour and they have an EC-130, request sitting in the right front seat because the pilot and the co-pilot, they might probably just have one pilot. Um, you know, there's, there's the seat all the way to the left and then the seat in the middle and all the avionics are in front of that. If it was a car, it'd be the dashboard with all the gauges, right? And then in the right, there's nothing there. There's just glass at your feet and all the way up above your head. You feel like you're floating in the air. I mean, there's a couple of little, you know, things for the windshield and shit blocking your view. But essentially, it's insane. And uh, <clears throat> flew that from Fullerton up to Cable. And... Uh, so that was like, you know, like a 10 minute flight and just getting to do that thing. And it just, once again, I actually think I like the, uh, the A star better, but they were just like, you know, compared to what I usually fly it, I literally felt like a baseball player that got called up from AAA. <laughs> you know, when you go to the next level, you're like, wow, this game's really fast. I don't know if I can hang around with this. But, uh, then after that, we went back to Fullerton. And another buddy of mine, he flew it on the way back and I got to sit, sit in that right-hand seat. And I, I just did not want the flight to end. And um, we landed there and then we took an Uber over to uh, the Heli Expo. And it's basically like, like the car show, but like with, with like helicopters. And uh, I got to tell you, I don't do well at those things. I had a great time at it, but like I, I literally have... I can be at those things for about an hour and then I just get fucking overwhelmed and I'm like, I don't even know where the exit is. There was so much stuff there. And I don't just mean like helicopters. It was just all... Dude, they were like showing all the different... These fucking... You know those bags where they, the, 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 the guys who fight fires scoop the water up in? They had like new ones of those. They had virtual reality things that I saw. Just like turbine engines sitting there and everything it was just like every gadget you could possibly think of there was this guy i met down there he had come up with this this remote control um 
like, uh, I can't even explain, like a helipad that you could just roll the helicopter in and out wherever the hell you wanted to go. He was controlling it with one hand while talking to somebody else. It looked like he had a Game Boy in his hand. And, and uh, the, uh, the helipad looked like, remember that, that Comedy Central show, BattleBots? The shit looked like that, right? And he was just, like, he just built it himself. It was, it was unbelievable. It had like tractor wheels on the back and then regular wheels on the front, like, but really small. And it was just moving this A star around like it was nothing. Um, but it's pretty cool. I got to meet uh, one of the head guys at uh, Cabri. Um, and uh, it, it was just, it was an amazing thing. But then, you know, I was there for like an hour and I was just like, you know, it just, I, I can't explain it. It's like, you know, I would say like one of the first times I ever, I went to the campus at the University of Michigan. Uh, a buddy of mine was going there at the time. This is way, way, it was like the fucking nineties. And I went to visit him and I got on that campus and it was so fucking big. They had their own bus system. And I just remember thinking like, I don't know how anybody could ever go to school. This is, this is fucking overwhelming, right? Uh, that's what I feel like at an expo. Like, and I always just go, all right, I got to get out of here. But I met like so many amazing people there and pilots and all of this shit. Um, you know, it's funny. <clears throat> I guess it's the same place they have that NAM show, which I've never been to. Um, nor do I think I ever will go to, which is the big musician show, right? And you get there, right? And it's essentially like every musical instrument you could think of, all of these musicians there, <clears throat> you go in there and it's like, I guess like 400 people playing guitar at the same time, another 300 people playing drums on another side. And it's just, I, 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 don't, I don't know how anybody goes to that shit. I mean, I would love to go down and look at all of this stuff, but I don't know. Like anytime I see videos of it, it just sounds like, you know, like whenever they have those, one of those fucking all-star jams, at the end of something and they have like five guitar players, three basses, two, three drummers and shit. And it just never fucking sounds good. <laughs> but at least they're playing the same song. It's just like, I just, somebody said going to that NAMM show is like going into a giant fucking guitar center, you know, and there's just all these fucking dads like me down there. But then they also have like, you know, amazing like professional musicians giving demonstrations. It's not all bad. Like, oh, this is all my own fucking issue. Um, but anyway, I did, uh, I did have a fucking, uh, great time, you know, for an hour. I can, I can do that for an hour. The same thing happened. I went to the auto show this year. Um, and what sucks about the auto show now is a lot of them don't even like send their cars anymore because they're kind of like, well, you know, everybody's, uh, talking about it on the internet. Why do I need to send the Mercedes in here? It's like, cause we want to fucking look at them, sit in them. Is that so wrong? But anyway, I got a chance to watch a Bruins game. Holy shit. Dad with two kids. I finally just decided, like, because I would always go, like, hey, guy, I, I would literally ask my kids. I would be like, guys, can I, can I put on the Bruins game? And then they'd just be like, Dad, you're always watching hockey. I'm like, and I'm literally going like, no, I don't. I never get to watch it. You guys are always watching whatever this show is, you know, with the, with the, the, the trains talking to each other, whatever you're watching here. Or the Grinch. I was telling my kids the other day, I go, do you know, you realize when I was a kid, the Grinch came on once a year. And if you missed it, that was it. If you pissed off your parents and they sent you to bed early or they wanted to watch the, the fucking news or something. I, mean, I don't curse. I don't, well, sometimes I do. <clears throat> but I didn't that time. Yeah, I was like, that, that was it. It was fucking over. You missed it. Oh, my God. I remember going to, like, school the next day. And kids would be like, did you see Santa Claus is coming to town? And I'd be like, that was on last night. <laughs> it was fucking over. Fucking over. You missed it. You absolutely missed it. So, anyways, I watched the Bruins crack. And we played, you know, we played mostly a good game and then we kind of let them get back in it. Fucking referees, Jesus Christ. They were loving Seattle though. You know, I'm not saying that's, that's uh, 
why we lost in the shootout, but Jesus Christ, they definitely, uh, you know, a lot of things went their way. We'll leave it that way. A lot of things went the cracking way. By the way, not a fan of the name, the Kraken, but I would say those uniforms are great, and that arena is amazing and everything. And uh, I got I got to get up there. Those are the last two things I need to see. I need to see a home game of the Seattle Kraken and the fucking Carolina Hurricanes, and then I am done. I've gone to every one of those things. And then what are you going to do, Bill? I don't know. I don't know. I'll have to find something else to go to. Imagine if it was like presidential libraries. I got a buddy of mine that's into presidential libraries. I'm just like, I just... That's another thing. I find those interesting. It is interesting. You know what's actually better? To go to like obscure presidents. Like how many libraries do they have? There's no fucking way. I can't go to like Calvin Coolidge's. When do they start with the libraries, you know? Like you're telling me, uh, I'm trying to think of a fucking, who's a good obscure president? Well, if I think if I know their name, like Calvin Coolidge. That's when presidents just had big square fucking heads. It was amazing because the food was all natural back then. Like, what the fuck were they eating? Just fucking taking down half of venison late at night. It's kind of funny, too, because there was like... (laughs) There was like no TV and shit back then or radio. Maybe during Calvin... I don't know when Calvin Coolidge was. He had a suit, so I figure that's kind of around the light bulb, right? But just think about that. Back in the day, if you had insomnia... I wonder what kind of stress you had back then. Well, there was a lot of stress, disease and that. Whatever, for some fucking reason, you can't sleep. You just know there's a bear in the area. You don't have your back ripped up like fucking Leo in that that goddamn movie. Oh, my God, that fucking scene. Um, Just walking around your log cabin. (laughs) Like, what could you do? What in the fuck did you do? Pitch black. You think about lighting a candle, but what predator are you going to attract? Let's take it out of the woods. That's scary enough. Oh, my God. I, I got to be honest with you. Still to this day, I think hunters, the fucking balls. I don't give a fuck you have a gun. You know what I mean? I don't give a fuck. The, If you're like, what is it, downwind? Something's downwind to you and smells you fucking coming and they're camouflaged. Jesus Christ. These fucking people with their AR-15s, you don't, you need that for a person? How slow a person? At 22, you can handle that. You go out in the fucking, the forest, not the woods. With his grizzly bears and shit, you absolutely need a fucking machine gun. (laughs) I'll kill all you motherfuckers. Like, oh my God. There's a book that I, I used to read my daughter and I'm now reading my son. And it freaks me out every time I read it. It's called Blueberries for Sale by Robert McCloskey, who wrote like Make Way for Ducklings. One morning in Maine, that broke-ass kid in Ohio, whatever his fucking name was with the harmonica. So I'm reading this book, too. And the book is basically this mother goes with her her daughter, Sal, to fucking pick blueberries to can them for the winter so they have something to eat, right? First of all, I love that part of the book. Well, there's just blueberries growing out in the wild. You can go out, you go out, you pick them. <clears throat> these women back then, they knew how to can them and all of that, and then they would, they would break them out, make a fucking pie. You know, back when women knew their place. Um, anyway, uh, so the whole story, spoiler alert, is they're going up the hill, and she's picking blueberries, and her daughter's behind her. She's like three years old, two years old, and she's picking blueberries. And on the other side of the hill, there's a mother bear with its cub 
And they are eating blueberries, trying to get fattened up. And they both, you know, talk about the relationships they have. Long story short, they both get separated, the kids, from the both mothers. I mean, there's terrible mothers in this book. Like, I don't, how the fuck you lose your kid in the goddamn wilderness as a bear or a person is fucking beyond me. But they do. And next thing you know, the kid is like following the fucking bear and the bear is following the mother. And it's just like, I know how the book goes, but every time the bear turns around, and looks at the kid, it's going to be, it's fattening itself up from the weekend. It's, it's going to eat the kid. A hundred percent is going to eat the kid. And then when the mom is near the, the, the baby bear, you know, the, if the mother comes along and you're anywhere near its cup, she's going to fucking maul you, both of you. Get the Leo DiCaprio, Leonardo DiCaprio treatment times two. But it's a kid's book, so everything fucking works out. But I just read that as someone who's terrified of bears getting mauled. Getting mauled. Fuck! Just kill me, you asshole! Stupid-ass fucking bear. I just don't understand why they can't kill you before they start eating you. They sort of start biting into your back. That's their fucking move. See, like, paralyzed? You know? And then you're like, <laughs> you can still feel the top half of your body. Eat my legs! Just eat my... <laughs> Hit an artery so I bleed out. Um, yeah, just as a parent, I just can't get over how fucking... Just what a bad mother she is. She's not even paying. I need not pay attention to your fucking kid that he the kid wanders off to that level. It literally, I, I don't like reading that book. I, I like the uh, Make Way for Ducklings. And the Make Way for Ducklings is sort of like a bad dad moment in there. You know, first of all, she's flying around. No place is good enough for her, right? That's never changed, woman or duck. They finally find this fucking place. They can settle down, right? He gives her the business. Next thing you know, she has eight fucking ducklings. And uh, right as they hatch, the fucking dude's like, eh, I'm going to take a little trip up the river here. Check out what's going on upstream. And he just leaves his wife with fucking eight little kids. They always get run over by a car. And then in the end, he's, they fucking meet him on the island. It's kind of like, I don't know. I don't know about the, the duck in that story. I kind of feel like he's one of those guys that has more than one family. <laughs> All right. Those are my book reviews, my children's book reviews. If you guys have any children's books for like three-year-olds you want me to review, tell me what they are. I'll buy them and I'll read them. Um, you know what I do like? I like Pete the Cat. Pete the Cat is fucking cool. You know, he's young, but he knows who he is. And uh, I don't know. He's wise beyond his years. All right. I'm talking too much here. All right. This is the podcast, everybody. Enjoy your weekends, you cunts. And uh, there's some music coming up picked up, picked out by the uh, amazingly talented Andrew Themelis. And then we have a bonus episode of the Thursday afternoon, just before Friday, Monday morning podcast uh, afterward. All right. That's it. And I'll talk to you later. Hey, what's going on? It's Bill Burr, and it's time for the Monday Morning Podcast for Monday, February 29th, 2016. Happy Leap Year! Oh, happy Leap Year, and happy birthday to the poor, sad cunts who only have a birthday once every four years. You know? Good Lord, can you imagine going on that first date with that broad bitching about that? I always felt left out. It was like... Everybody else had a birthday every single year. It was like I was zero, then I was four, then I was eight. You know, she'd be in good shape, though, huh? Eating fucking 75% less birthday, birthday cake every year, right? Now, wait, how does that math work out? If in four years you had four slices of cake, right, but you were born in the leap year, you only had one. Yeah, that percentage doesn't work because, you know, you have one, somebody else has two, they got 100% more than you got, right? They got all, provided that they're equal slices. Oh, Jesus, Bill, you're going you gonna to break out fractions? I think I'm going to. Let's do a little birthday cake fractions. All right, so they're getting fucking 300% more cake than you are? 
Man, I bet, you know something? I bet anybody who's born on February 29th is either a miserable cunt or just one of the coolest laid back people. Like, you know, oh my God, another birthday. Aren't the years flying by? No, no, they're not actually, to be honest with you. That's kind of weird. So like, when the fuck are you actually like, like say when you're 29, you know, that doesn't work. You're 28. It's got to be fours, right? Wait, you're zero. Jesus Christ. This would be fucking annoying. Zero, if you had a baby born on the 29th, right? You're, if, you're zero the first year. All right? One, two, three. No, four. I'd be back again to four, right? I don't fucking know. All I know is it's somebody's birthday today, and it hasn't been their birthday since 2012. So happy fucking birthday. What does that work out? 16, 15, 14, 13. 12 would be five years ago. I can't fucking do it. I don't know when it was. Is it once every three years? Ah, Jesus. Anything that happens every four years usually sucks. People's birthdays on leap year, World Cup soccer, the Olympics, you know. I actually like Olympic hockey, but then I hate all those fucking douches who never watch hockey. And they'd be like, see, if it was like this, I would watch it all the time. What, only two weeks long with no fighting, you fucking douche? Beat it. Nobody cares whether you watch it or not. At least I don't. At least I don't. So um, anyways, I apologize for the, uh, you know what? I don't apologize. Oh, I, okay, I will. I will. I'll apologize for the podcast being this late. I was going to do it on Sunday. When I was up in Foxwoods, dude, let's go to the fucking casino out in the middle of the woods, you know? Um, I was going to record on Sunday, but uh, Verzi got some tickets to see the UConn-Houston uh, Cougars game up, uh, you know, big fucking program. By the way, man, how about the, fi- you know, very quietly, I probably shouldn't say very quietly, I just don't pay attention to the sports, ladies' hoops, you know? I knew that fucking... Uh, Tennessee with Pat Summit, right, was fucking crushing it. And I know UConn was, I thought they were doing all right, but I thought it was mainly fucking Pat Summit. And then I went to the goddamn UConn game. I got a picture of it here on my phone. You know, somebody sent me a picture of a freck, of a, a hairless pit bull that had freckles. It's the most adorable thing you've ever seen in your life, but the person said it looked like me. <laughs> oh, I like a good tweet, you know. I don't. I don't give a shit if you break my balls if it makes me laugh. All right. So the fucking ladies, the lady huskies. Well, let's do it in order here. Let's do the guys first, considering they have way less. You know, you always want to build towards your closing bit. All right. The guys, the fellas, have won four national championships since 1999. All right. The UConn men's huskies have won 1999, 2004, 2011, 2014. That's very fucking respectable. Has anybody won more than that? I don't know. I'm not going to look it up. Kentucky or Duke, I would guess. Maybe not Duke, right? Duke, Duke, Duke. All right. Um, but the ladies, they won it in 95. They won it in 2000, 2002, 2003, 2004, 2009. And then the fucking goddamn... Poor excuse for speakers hanging from that fucking building that they have with the ceilings peeling is in the way of the next two banners. They won it 2014, 2015. Now I got to fucking look it up. Well, as far as what I can see here on the phone, that's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And there's two other banners behind it. That's got to be a championship one. Yeah, national champions. What an asshole. Why the fuck didn't I walk down and take it correctly? Or maybe look it up before I did this? All right, hang on a second. Hang on, hang on, hang on. Oh, Jesus. Now I'm typing on my phone. This is going to take for fucking ever. I looked up the most random women's huskies. Why would I write that? That's not going to get me there. Yukon Huskies Championships. All right. Give me the ladies. Give, the ladies better come up first. Ah, the men's do. You sexist motherfuckers. National championships. You fucking... uh, Hang on. Ladies. Ladies. There we go. Connecticut women's basketball. I apologize. If I had any fucking decency, I would edit most of this out. But I'm not going to. 
All right, national tournament championship, conference championship. Jesus fucking Christ, nobody cares about any of this. Elite eight, final four, tournament champions. 95, 2000, 2002, 2003, 2004, 2009, 2010, 2013, 2014, 2015. One, two, three, four, five. They won it five out of the last six fucking years. And since the year 2000, remember that cone a bit? They've won it one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine fucking times. Total domination. Fuck a dog snoring. You know my dog's getting fat. I don't know what's going on with her. We've changed this food. We started getting her an extra can because she's always fucking coming over licking the bowl there. You know, we felt bad for her. Now you should see her. She looks like a fucking state worker, right? Tennessee lady falls. All right, here we go. Come on, Wikipedia. Where the fuck are you? Lady Vol. What, what do you say? What do, what do you think? Who do you think has more, huh? I got to go with Connecticut at that point, huh? Bill, this might be the most boring podcast ever. Well, what, what you, you know, you get what you pay for. <laughs> All right, fuck it. I'm not looking it up anymore. My eyes are seeing, seeing double here. Um, very impressed with both of them, man. They're, they're quietly crushing. It's a nice small campus. They play in this little ass building with, with shit peeling from the ceiling. The student section was hilarious. You know, when they introduce the other team, they sit there reading the newspaper. I thought that was funny. Now I'm sure somebody's going to say, well, LK, Alcorn fucking university used to do that. I don't give a shit. It's the first time I saw it. It was funny to me. Um, dude, there was a guy sitting behind us like, Classic New England sports fan. I, I never heard a guy like he, anytime the ball didn't go in for the Huskies, he, he had a reason every fucking time down the court. And this is what killed me. So I'm like, all right, this guy's a total hoop head. Right. And I turn around and he has on a Red Sox hat and T-shirt. So he's basically a sports maniac. Right. The guy missed a shot. He'd be like, hey, he didn't follow through. Next time they come down the court, they be like, hey, the guy, he should have been rotating around. He should, the second they had the double team, he should have been rotating around. Next time down the court, somebody slips. It was, what is that, something wrong with the floor? And I just kept nudging Verzi. He would, he would go on like, like, like the fucking lady uh, Huskies there. He would go on like four five, four, five uh, runs there. Except instead of winning championships, he'd be like bitch moaning and complaining. And at one point he made a point, you know, they threw it to their big goof there, and that guy fucking missed the ball. And uh, the guy goes, you know, if he had a pair of hands, he would have had two there. And Verzi turned around and goes, you know what, you're right. And the guy just looked at him with like an angry look. Like he was, he was so pissed that UConn was losing. And we actually, uh, you know, I know they're only having a mediocre year this year. I mean, you can't fucking win it every year. But um, you could sense when you were in there the level, how seriously everybody was taking it. Because Verzi kept saying, like, wow, these people take this shit really seriously here. And I just kept pointing up to all the banners. I'm like, uh, I would say at this point, they're kind of used to winning. So I guess they're having a disappointing year. I guess. I have no idea. I didn't look it up. I just started talking about it. It's what I did. But that's why the podcast um, was not ready. Um, I had a great time up at uh, Foxwoods. Um, resort casinos, by the way. I want to thank them for having me. It was their 24th anniversary, right? So they say to me, um, before I get there, they said, is there any way before your first show, if you could come down, um, there's a big dinner or something, we'd love if you could meet the uh, the tribal council and just stop by and say hello, right? These are my employers for the weekend. What am I going to say no? So I'm like, Absolutely. I want to meet these Native Americans that fucking beat the white man, you know, and got their own fucking casino. Right. So I go down there and I just thought I was going to swing by a table and say hello to somebody. Thank them for the gig. And next thing you know, they got this whole this is like fucking eyes wide shut fucking dinner going on. You know, the shining kind of shit in the bowels of the casino. There's some band and there's a stage and there's like this guy smiley looking fucking political guy on stage. And next thing you know, he's he's given me an intro. I had no fucking idea I was going on. I have no idea who these people are. And furthermore, these people had no idea who I was. And I just walk out and they go, Please, we got a local funny man here this weekend. Please welcome comedian Bill Burr. And I was standing there going, is he bringing me up? Is he bringing me up? And I just fucking walk on stage. I take the mic and I was like, I'm looking out at all these old people and shit. And they're just staring at me. I was like, uh... I kind of had no idea I was, uh, 
I was going to be brought up here, but, um, you know, congratulations on 24 years. Uh, I'm sure most of you people here know who the next four presidents are going to be. On behalf of regular people, if you could do something about the population problem, I'd really appreciate it. And all of this shit is getting nothing, right? I just started talking to them like they were running the world. And they're just looking at me like I got fucking ten heads. And I just said, I just sort of petered out. And I went, and uh, onward and upward. (laughs) I just handed it back. The guy smiley. And there was just like a little smattering of applause. And I just walked back into the hall with the promoter. And as we're walking away, I was like, what the, what the fuck was that? And he's like, oh, I don't know. That's how he talks. I didn't, I didn't know what it was. I, mean, I thought you were drunk. I was under the impression that you were going to just say hello at the table. You know, nobody knows anything, right? And they just fucking wheel you around. Um, yeah, and then we just fucking, I think we got on a golf cart at that point. We, no, no. We, then we walked through the halls. And then they walked me by the crowd that was going into my show. So I looked like a complete jerk off. I fucking, I love seeing people after the show. I fucking hate seeing people before the show. I don't know why. I don't know if it's a superstition. It's just weird to me to be, for me to just be walking by. Like the first time you see me, I'm just walking down the fucking hall. Oh, there's that jerk off. And then you just start looking at him. Why did I pay to see that? Look at him. <laughs> But anyways, we had a um, we had a great fucking time. I had a bunch of family and friends coming out, people I hadn't seen in years. Do you know my, my first best friend that I ever had in life actually came up to the gig, and um, I hadn't seen him in 36 years. And um, I was actually thinking the last time I saw him, you know, the reason why I, I, my family, we moved away from the town that we had lived in. And um, I just remember we were both, how fucking old was I? I think we were like seven or eight. And you don't know how to say goodbye. You know, I'd probably been friends with the kid since I was like four. So basically half my life I was friends with this kid. So we had loaded up the moving van the last time, like we were doing the U-Haul thing. You know, we'll do it ourselves. And we just made like 900 fucking trips in this thing. And um, we were loading it up for the last time. And uh, he lived across the street from me. So I walked down my driveway and he was out there and he knew this was, he knew it was it. I knew it was it. And we were just too young. Didn't know. Yeah. You know what to say. It's seven. So some kid rode by and had just ridden by on a bike. And I remember he just said something to me like, oh yeah, that kid was trying to say that blah, 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 blah. I couldn't remember anything. I was like, oh yeah. Yeah. Okay. I was like, all right. All right. And he just started to walk away, and I walked away in the other direction. And then we both looked over our shoulder at the same time, and then that was it. I got in the fucking U-Haul. <laughs> and that was it. I think I came back to the neighborhood like four years later. I saw him one other time. So, yeah, 1980. Because I left in 76, saw him in 80, and then I hadn't seen him since then. So uh, we got caught up talking about the old fucking times, man. We didn't even get into it either, man. Jesus Christ, some of the shit we used to do. You know, we used to play with fucking matches. That's what you used to do back then when there was like, like playing with matches was like, I don't know, like having a Game Boy or whatever these fucking kids do nowadays. And his dad had these things. We used to, they were, we used to call them uh, monkey matches. It was just a book of matches. And for some reason, they, it just had a picture of a monkey like wearing like a hat, like like, that was, like, highbrow humor back then, like, dressing monkeys up like human beings, you know, and also having pictures of dogs playing poker and shit, passing cards underneath the table with their paws and shit, you know? So his dad, for whatever reason, always had these matchbooks that had pictures of monkeys that were, like, you know, dressed like dentists, you know, like lab coats on and shit or just some stupid fucking hat, you know? And uh, so we would... <laughs> this is what we would do. We would go over... And we would like, basically underneath the tree, we would bunch up a bunch of pine needles and you would just light it on fire and just look at the fire and then try and put it out. And, um, you know, sometimes you put it out, sometimes you didn't, sometimes a neighbor would come running over, Christ, what the fuck are you kids doing? What the hell are you doing? Um, I did that one time. I lit it and all of a sudden it just got completely out of control and this guy came running over with a giant trash can that he had filled up with water. Thank fucking Christ. And um, and then somebody else in the neighborhood, I remember, fucking lit it on fire. Lit the whole fucking woods on fire. And uh, 
I know who I know who it was too because he rode down to the fire station and and said that he didn't do it, but he knows that he knew that my friend did it, and he fucking ratted out my friend. And I'm sure the fire department was looking at the kid, looking at him like, "Listen, you little rat, we know you fucking did it, right?" Um. So whatever, it was cool to see him, and um, I don't know what the fuck I'm talking about. I, I hate doing this thing after I've been on a fucking plane. You know? Oh, you know what I watched on the plane? For the second time, I saw the movie uh, Black Mask. You know? I know that that kind of got mixed reviews. That's one of those movies you got to see it more than once. See it the second time. Dude, Johnny Depp is fucking unbelievable in that movie. He's unfucking believable And um, there's a couple other actors there. I got to get their fucking names. They were absolutely amazing. But uh, I, I liked it the first time. I loved it the second time I saw it. So... Um, you know, I know, I, but most of the people I heard from were from Massachusetts. They're like, dude, the fucking accent, you, you, you shut the fuck up. You know, when I went to Fargo, they were bitching about the fucking accents in Fargo. Does that mean Fargo's a bad movie? Well, why don't, why don't we hire you, who's not an actor? We'll have you fucking do it, and we'll see how that works out. But um, I just felt, you know, the second time when I saw it, like the pacing of it, I felt like it, they tied it in to like the absolute sociopath main character that they were trying. You were so fucked up as I'm nervous about talking about it. That's the level of power that those fucking guys had. Um, it's, it reminded me of the Shawshank Redemption where a lot of people I know the first time they saw that, they didn't like that movie because they felt it was so long and was dragging on and on and on and on. But um, my, my theory on that movie was they were giving you the sense of what it was like to do time where it becomes like this open-ended thing. No beginning, no middle, no end. It actually sounds like I'm shitting on the movie, but it just, the way it would fade down and then just fade up. And every time in the crowd, you'd like be anticipating that there'd be this major f- turn and it was just another day in prison a few years later. Um, I kind of felt like they were trying to do that with the Whitey Bulger character, where... Um, you know, they were saying like he was a sociopath, like they, and how he slowly drew in the FBI guys to the point that they were entangled in his bullshit, um, and he insulated himself that way. I, I really, I don't know. Maybe I was too dumb to get all of that shit the first time, but the second time I watched it, like I said, I went from liking that movie to fucking loving that movie. So, um, whatever, give it a shot if you haven't. But um, speaking of which. The fucking Oscars were last night, huh? White guys fucking crushing it. Oh, we fucking squeaked cleaned up last night. Woo! (laughs) Um, Just fucking with you, man. That was a... uh, I only got to see... I got to see Chris Rock's opening monologue, which I thought was great. I thought he handled the whole thing fucking perfectly. Um... And uh, what else did I see? I didn't see a lot. Because right as it started, the show was starting. I think we had a 9 o'clock show and it started a little bit after 8. But um, I have no idea who won what. I know the Boston movie about the fucking pedophile priest. I heard that that thing won. Um, That was it. Nobody fell down. Nothing else happened. Right? Is that it? Oh, very quietly, the first uh, Asian director, I believe, ever fucking won something. Is that what I saw? I don't know. This is, you know, just a reoccurring thing. I'm not going to look anything up. I'm just going to start talking about it. And, uh, you know, that's going to be it. You know what? I don't understand, like, I don't understand the weight that people put on the fucking Oscars, though. I really got to tell you that, though. You know what I mean? I just don't, I don't fucking get it. I was joking this weekend, like just sitting there watching a bunch of adults running around wanting to win a trophy. It's like, well, what are you in fucking Little League? (laughs) Trophies are for kids, aren't they? You give ribbons and shit and it makes them feel good and you take them out for a fucking snow cone and then that's it, you know? You put them to bed, you get yourself a whiskey and you sit there and you stare at the wall. I mean, that's basically your life. I mean, what, what, what how old are you? You need a fucking trophy? Um, yeah, I, I don't, I don't give a shit about like that type of stuff, but I, I definitely think that there should be opportunity for everybody. You know, I'd like to hear everybody's stories. Um, so I had no problem with any of that shit. Um, uh, but I do just think it's funny that people fucking flip out and start crying about winning a goddamn trophy. And this trophy means more than that trophy. This one's more prestigious. Um, all right. 
let's i gotta do a couple reads here for this week where the fuck am i clicking on there all right um all right and with that it's mercifully over it's mercifully over um all right i don't know if you guys know this but i guess they're working on cars that are going to drive themselves in the future um i don't know why I mean, how fucking lazy are people going to get? I mean, it's going to be great for drinking and driving. It'd just be drinking and riding. You know, you all of a sudden, you'll always have that fucking thing, right? I, I, don't, I don't like this, man. I don't like how everything's becoming fucking automated. You know, I feel like rich people are gradually phasing us out, you know? Because you know goddamn well, the only reason why they allow us to exist is because they need us to farm Right? They need us to deliver shit. They need us to do a bunch of shit. And I, I could add another example. I don't know. Dance around like a monkey at a fucking casino. Come downstairs and say a couple of words at your little fucking Illuminati party in the basement. They need us to do that. But once everything is automated and it just handles it its fucking self, do you think you could be a part of that group? What if you were a part of a group that was just going to slowly fucking just phase everybody else out? You know? And somehow it was, would happen in your lifetime. All right? Like, who would you keep? These are very Hitler-esque type questions, but this is the type of fucking madness that I, I think everybody's capable of. You know, especially, um, I don't know, if you travel on the road, some of the dopes you fucking meet out there, watching people getting stirred up, you know? In all honesty, I can't stand, like, the choices that we have for president right now, you know, as it starts to go towards, as a fucking torpedo uh, that fucking St. Bernard looking guy, Bernie Sanders, right? His jowls, um, as they torpedo his fucking campaign and all Democrats are walking around. He can't win. He can't win. I love that. I love it. Yeah. Cause you're too much of a pussy to fucking vote for him. That's why. Right. So you're going to vote for this fucking, this clammy fucking crook or this guy who isn't saying anything. But like, I really believe that, you know, you could talk people into fucking wiping out everybody on the planet. He's very easily just listening to Donald Trump his speeches where he just says absolutely nothing. You know, he said today he was talking to college graduates and he's literally going like, I'm going to bring jobs back to the United States. You wait, there's going to be more jobs here. By the time I'm done, it's going to make your head spin. I'm going to have, I'm going to have Apple bring manufacturing jobs back from China to here. Okay. And people clapped. (laughs) He never has to say how he's going to do all. I'm going to plug up the hole in the ozone layer. Water's going to be clear. I'm going to get rid of all terrorism. And that's going to be the first week. Woo! I like this guy. This guy makes sense. He's making it great again. You know? And then you got Hillary. out. She just talks through her fucking teeth. It's like, you know, she looks like she should be doing like a ventriloquist act, but the puppet isn't there. Um... (laughs) I just can't fucking. I don't know. I have no. I don't know. I don't fucking know. No idea. And I don't even know who the other guys are. I just heard a couple of them talking, trying to trash Donald Trump, and they just they sounded pathetic. Just not good speakers. This is just. A, this is a bad one. This is a bad one. You know. Like I bet people watching. You know. You know, if you got a great college program and a bunch of seniors fucking graduate, graduate, and you just, you know, you just go through a bad four year period. I think that's what we're coming through. We're coming out of right now. You know, I like this one guy who was saying he was going to get rid of Obamacare if he was elected and people like applauding. Like, I, I, just, I don't fucking get it. I don't get why. I don't even I don't have Obamacare. I guess my tax dollars pay for it, but I don't have any problem with somebody like. I don't want my fellow countrymen walking around with a fucking toothache. <laughs> <laughs> you need your spleen removed. Fuck you. Figure it out for yourself. Why don't we help each other out a little more, you know? Why can't we do that? And if elected, anybody needs this spleen out? Donald Trump, I bet I could run. I could run for president if that's all you got to do is just say you're going to do all this awesome shit and you never fucking do it. Everyone will have health care and it will be free. All right. Um. Oh, this weekend, by the way. Oh, the self-driving cars. Let's get back to that fucking thing. So evidently some self-driving car hit a bus, which is fucking tremendous for anybody who loves driving. That is such a tremendous fucking thing that happened today or yesterday or maybe last year. All I know is I just found the fucking story. I'm so fucking psyched. The self-driving car hit the fucking 
hit the fucking bus. I mean, it, even though it was only going like two miles an hour, it's just so fucking great because it, it hit a bus. So all you got to say is just, you know, just be like, well, what if, what if there was a bunch of kids on that bus, right? And then that'll delay it a good 20 fucking years. Um, let me see if I can find this story. Self-driving. Google says it bears some responsibility after self-driving car hits bus. Can you fucking believe that? Well, was there, was there a person driving the bus? I would say that you, you, you have all the fucking responsibility unless this guy literally drove into the fucking thing. Alphabet Incorporate, Incorporated Google said on Monday it bears some responsibility after one of its self-driving cars struck a minu- municipal bus in a minor crash earlier this month. The crash may be the first case of one of its auto- autonomous cars hitting another vehicle and the fault of the self-driving car. Dude, this is going to be a shit show. This is just one, and it already hit a fucking bus. You know what I mean? Ah, that's fucking, that's lunacy. It's fucking lunacy, man. I will tell you, it, I mean, I think it'll, 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 it will cause people to drink like they've never drank before. I, I mean, half, most nights I don't drink out here because I, you know, I drive myself places. You know, I don't fucking Uber. Well, that'll put Uber out of business, Right. Well, I guess if you don't have a fucking car. I don't know. Don't you guys like driving? I hope you have, like, the option. My thing is, how is the insurance going to work? Because you know goddamn well there's no way the insurance company is going to take that fucking liability on. And they're they're claiming they're going to get rid of, there'll be no more deaths from car accidents. There's going to be no more accidents. It's just going to be, it's going to be, like, just accident-free. And this is amazing to me that this that it's gotten this fucking far, considering, you know, that like the amount of times they tried to kill the electric car. Right. And, you know, big oil companies, that type of thing. I mean, you're fucking with their their blue blood money. You are not having that. Let's go electrocute an elephant to show how fucking dangerous these cars are. Right. So. Like, I. This is the only thing I can think. What these insurance companies? They're making enough money to go down there and whack somebody at ABC Incorporated, right? You know they fucking do shit like that. You go to a diner and all of a sudden you stagger out, going, "They poison me," and you do a face plant. Then your invention disappears. Oh, I'm going down the rabbit hole. This is why I think they're letting this one go through because <clears throat> they're eventually going to get rid of all of us, and when they do that, they're going to have no more limo drivers. So they're like, well, 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 what are we going to do in the future if we want to ride somewhere? I mean, I'm not going to drive my car and soil my wealthy hands, am I? And then somebody's like, well, what if we just had a, we'll just make the cars drive themselves. Oh, okay. Then, okay. Kill them all then. Yes, thank you. Poison them, remove them from the planet. Um, I wonder if they got rid of everybody, how long it would take for this, fun, you know. To go back to normal, you have to take all the nuclear waste, right? Just send it out, you know, out into fucking space, right? Send it towards Mars. Just make sure you don't hit the moon. And all you do is just fucking chill out in your, your little house. I wonder how long it would take to undo all that. But all this shit that people leave behind, you know? The fuck are you going to do with all of that? That's all going to go into the soil. And take a little, you know, it wouldn't happen in your lifetime. Jesus Christ, I am all over the place, man. What the fuck am I talking about here? Murdering people and self-driving cars. You should see this fucking car, by the way. This fucking self-driving car makes the Volkswagen Beetle look like a goddamn Lamborghini. People on the Simpsons drive a better looking car than that fucking thing. Ugh, you know, they're all going to be the exact same fucking one, right? You'll have your options of like three different colors, like white, black, or beige. (laughs) Oh, man, this is not uplifting. I'll tell you what's uplifting. March 5th, this weekend, UFC 196, Conor McGregor. Um, UFC 196, what are they calling this one? Did they they stop naming them, by the way? Have they come up with 196 adjectives that, that, that describe... How fucking tremendous that sport that sport is. 
You know, they were UFC 12, the redemption, the revenge, or whatever. They always had like these cool fucking names. Up to, once you get up to like 196, they got to be running out, right? Let me see what they got here. UFC 196, Conor McGregor versus some guy Diaz. I wish I knew these guys' names better. I, I'm, you know, there's only so much shit I can pay attention to. Um, he's taking on late replacement Nate Diaz. Ah, Jesus, what happened? He was supposed to fight somebody else? Rafael, I'm not going to fucking insult it. Latinos by trying to pronounce it. Although I could make, give you a good laugh here. Rafael Dos Anjos. Rafael Dos Anjos. Um, was bounced from his sh- showdown against Connor with a broken foot. Ah, forget the fuck. Do you know I was reading something on McGregor today? Do you know? I don't understand. I don't. Somebody in the fight game, please explain this to me. That guy walks around at 170 and he's shredded. And then before his fight, for whatever fucking reason, he's got to go down to 145. Now I, I can understand if the other guy just walks around at 145. Or maybe 155. And Connor, for whatever reason, just wants to beat the fuck out of the guy. So he's willing to starve himself down to 145. For the love of God, can anybody in the fight game that, that, that does this, why can't, you know, if Connor walks around at 170 and the other guy's walking around at 165, why don't they just fight it like 160? Why do they got to bring everybody all the way the fuck down there? I, I, for the, I just don't understand why they got to do that shit. Um, check out the Sports Illustrated article on uh, on Conor McGregor. They got like this whole thing where they only briefly talk about it, um, but they're talking about cutting weight, and it actually sounds in a lot of ways worse than the fight. Like talking about the pain and the agony of it, and it's I, I can't even. Uh, I'm not going to be able to do it justice because I just read it. I have a very poor memory, and I've never gone through it. But uh, Holly Holmes also fighting against uh, Misha Tate. And uh, I'm taking a night off from stand-up, and I'm going to fucking hang. You know what's great? This is the one sport that I can really watch with my wife. Like, she likes going to live hoop, too, but she loves the fucking UFC. She gets into it, like, in a, at a crazy level. Like that time when he, that guy kicked, uh, kicked the other dude, and he had the compound fracture, you know, and his fucking leg bent all the way back. I was just like, I walked out. I'm like, all right, done, done. I can't watch that. She she was rewinding it, wanted to watch it again, and was like like literally interested in it. Um, which means she either should have been a serial killer or gotten into the medical field because if you can fucking stomach that. Um, either way, I can. Um, I'm really excited to see this shit this weekend. I like it, even if they're quick fights, even if it's a bad thing. Doesn't it make you at least want to work out? You see those guys and fucking women getting in there. They're all fucking jacked. You look down at yourself, usually finishing off a pizza. You're like, what the fuck am I doing? I'm going down to Home Depot tomorrow. I'm getting a sledgehammer and a big fucking tire. You know? And you know what? You do it for a couple days and then you quit. That's why you're not a champion. Like what you're going to see on fucking Saturday. There you go. There's my promo for the UFC. Um, all right. Let's, uh, let's, let's read some fucking letters for this week, shall we, everybody? Chances are because of Cleo, you're losing your figure, sweetheart. Glad you didn't walk the red carpet at the at the fucking Oscars. They would have been all over you. All right. Leaving the country if Trump wins. Dear Billy elect, what's your take on people who say they're going to leave the country if Trump wins? Uh, besides the potential for lanes to open up on the highway, I just hope. The people that say they're going to leave, leave so I don't have to point out who's a lying sack of shit. Um, They're obviously joking. No one's going to leave this country, but uh, it's just, you know, he's a very extreme guy. You know, I think people said that when Obama, they definitely said it during George Bush. It was some famous star said it, I remember. I thought it was like funny. Then, of course, Fox News was, why don't you leave? Why don't you get the fuck out of here? You're like, fucking lunacy. Um, what do I think about people say that I think it's kind of hacky at this point? I think that's what everybody says when there's somebody that's on the fringe on one side or the other. Somebody always ends up going, if this guy fucking wins, I'm going to leave. Where are you going to go? This is what people forget. When you, uh, when you leave this country, you, you immediately become an immigrant who's taking somebody else's job in the country that you're going to, and you get treated as such, you know, even if you're white. 
They don't want they don't want Americans moving up to Canada, fucking with their population, taking their jobs. You know, all of a sudden you're standing there driving a spike into a tree to take out some maple syrup instead of the other guy. They don't want that. They don't want that at all. Um. All right. Yeah, I just think they're just they're saying. I mean, it's it's fucking scary. I mean, it's both scary. I think Hillary's a fucking lying sack of shit, a totally dishonest, and I think uh, Donald Trump is a reality show star. That's the best we can fucking do. <laughs> I just don't fucking get it. It keeps getting worse. Jesus fucking, the last guy, the last guy that I thought was decent was the first George Bush. You know? I like when he went into Kuwait and then like he, he said, all right, that's enough. That's enough. He didn't go all fucking nuts and we got the fuck out of there. You know, and then fucking Clinton came in. I don't know what the fuck. That was a big frat party. All right, he's getting his dick sucked. He's lying about shit. People got stuff on him, mysteriously die. I mean, it was fucking nuts. And then he bombed some people to get out of a fucking blowjob accusation. The whole fucking thing was, I don't know. It's been crazy ever since. Um. I don't know shit about politics. Don't listen to me. All right. Boyfriend's smoking habit. Hey, Mr. Burr. Love the podcast and the stand-up. Come to Rochester, New York soon. Uh, I would love... Oh, you know what? You know what? There's a Buffalo date and a Syracuse date in the works. Yes, ma'am. Yes, sir. Whatever, whatever this is writing this shit. Um, uh, what the fuck? I just scrolled down. Sorry. Love the podcast and the stand-up. Come to Rochester, New York. I would appreciate some advice from yourself and the lovely Nia if she's available. Uh, she ain't here today, man. All right. I've been with my boyfriend for almost two years, and since day one, I knew of his daily weed-smoking habit. He doesn't let, her, let it hinder his life. Still very social, faithful going to going to work every day. Uh, he's scheduled. He eats healthy, and he goes to the gym four to five days a week. I tried getting used to it um, since it's something that he does and it, and it isn't a problem in his life. But I've never wanted to try drugs or alcohol, so I don't know what the feeling of being under the influence of something is like. Now because, now because of that, my problem is unless I see him during the day, and even then he'll take a hit, he's not sober. Is it wrong of me to be concerned that whenever he sees me, he's under the influence of something. Uh, whenever we go to the movies or a comedy show, he'll bring half a cookie so he can, quote, enjoy the show more. And why don't I want him to relax after work by vaping a bag and hanging out with me? Considering this habit hasn't, hasn't hindered his life in any way, do I have a reason to be uneasy about this? I understand why he does it, and he tells me it doesn't affect his feeling about feelings about me and about us being together, but it still makes me uneasy whenever I know he's high. Um, yeah, well, I mean, if you don't like it, you don't like it. And if he enjoys it, he enjoys it. So you both know where you stand. Um, I got to be honest. I mean, if someone was drinking every day, there would be probably an issue with that. Although there's no medicinal purposes for uh, alcohol, is there? Unless they're taking an arrow out of your back. Don't they, like, rub some on your gums or some shit? I can't remember how it goes. You take a shot. Is that what it is? You bite down on a fucking garden hose? I don't remember. Um, yeah, I mean, if he's getting fucking baked all the time and he always, you know, so he'll enjoy it more, yeah, that's a little bit of a red flag. I, You know, honestly, if you're fucking doing it every day and you're never really sober and you just sort of constantly just sort of high... Um, that's probably not a good way to go through life, but it is his choice. I would just tell him, just be like, look, I'm not saying you can't smoke, but like you, you, you're high all the time and I'm sober. So I'm constantly talking to a, a buzzed you and, um, it bothers me. I would just tell him that. And I, I think that it's going to bother him because when you fucking smoke weed like that, it's a religion. You know what I mean? It's not like, you know, every day he comes home and he does this one little thing, puts his shoes in the wrong spot or some shit. This is like you're talking about his state of consciousness when he's around you at all fucking times, basically. You want him to alter that. So that's a, kind of a major change. Um, he didn't tell me how old he was. 
But uh, I don't know. I don't know much about weed. I know some people say they get productive when when they're when they're using it and that type of stuff. But uh, I don't know. I, I I really feel that you know. And this is somebody who's like realized that his drinking is out of control again. So I just sort of I've stopped for the last fucking three days. Um. I mean, I really have to watch it with myself, okay? Because I have the kind of job where, you know, I can get fucked up every night, basically, and then sleep in the next day. Now, granted, my career would suffer and I wouldn't get anywhere. And eventually, you know, but I mean, I could do some, before, like, my career totally did a fucking nosedive, provided I didn't, like, you know, do something stupid, like fucking, you know, get behind the wheel of a car, fucking assault somebody. If I was just getting drunk every day, um, yeah, that would affect where I was in the business, but it'd be like a long seven year, like tapering off, you know, back to doing the comedy vault at Remington's in Boston, which doesn't exist anymore. But, um, you know, I, I don't know. I, I, I just personally, I know I really got to watch it. And my, my, my thing about people who smoke weed is the fact that they can be on it and nobody really knows like, you know, and once they're high all the time, they're experienced being high and they can just go to work being high. And uh, you can't do that drunk. You can't go to work like, you know, shotgun a beer and walk in. People just know it just doesn't work. Um, but I'm not exact, 100% against it the way I used to in the early days of this podcast when I didn't know a lot about it. Now I'm understanding that there's certain people, you know, if they have really active minds, they need to fucking chill out. It's actually a great thing. Um, for them, but I, I really think if you're doing it all the fucking time like that, yeah, like this, there's probably cause for an issue there, you know, to bring it up like, hey, you're kind of fucking basically wasted every time I talk to you. And then also, you know, that whole thing, you know, he brings half a cookie so he can enjoy the show. It's like you, you can't enjoy it sober. Like those are kind of some um, red flags. I don't know. And I also think that you can get addicted to that shit. You know, I think you. I think your guy is. To be honest with you, people always say, "Nah, you're not really addicted to it." Oh yeah, you just do it every waking moment. You can't fucking enjoy something unless you're under the influence of it. There's something there. It's just because it's such a mellow thing, and it's not like, uh, you know, I got I got a buddy of mine from back in the day, dude. He's completely fucking addicted to that shit. He says, "I love weed because it, it turns my life into a movie." And, um, you know, he's basically been high since we were sophomores in high school. And uh, without a doubt, it's fucked with his memory. Without a doubt, it's it's fucked with his drive. You know, I don't know. But I understand wanting to get fucked up every day, personally. It's fun. <laughs> The thing with weed, it's so easy. A couple of puffs and then boom, you're there. You know, drinking takes it out. I got to stop talking about this. So I'm going to have a drink. I said I'd take a week off here. So, all right. Well, good luck with that. I would just, I would just say how you're feeling. And um, if he gives, you know, gives you shit back, I'd just be like, look, I mean, I'm, I'm not being an asshole here. You're just like, you're high every day. Can you just like not be high a couple days a week? But, like, how do you do that and not feel like you're infringing on this guy's fucking lifestyle? I mean, that's, I don't know. I would bring it up to him, as I said 20 minutes ago before I meandered my way through that. Sorry about that. All right. I fucked up. Please advise. Dear Billy Ginger Cakes, I am a 26-year-old fucking lady who is a tremendous fan of your work in all its glorious forms. Well, thank you very much. Uh, that scene in Efforts for Family with the dad balls. When Bill is stuck under the bed is the funniest fucking thing I've ever seen. Brilliant. Well, thank you. I appreciate that. Um, I did I did something really, then all capitals, really dumb. And I would greatly appreciate your insight because I know you will tell me the ever elusive truth. I won't tell you. Well, I won't, I'll tell you what I think is the truth, whether it's the right answer. You got you to decide that for yourself. I have been friends with this guy for about two years, and now you fucked him and you ruined the friendship. That's what, I'm, that's, a, that's what I'm guessing here. We met through a larger group of friends. There was chemistry between us immediately. This guy is so... He's married. Trying to see where, how, how, how this can go off the rails. 
This are this this is reading in the beginning like one of those dating sites. You know, they play that stupid piano. That stupid that dumb shit. This could be a serial killer. This could be a sex offender. I don't know. Uh, we met through a larger group of friends. There was chemistry between us immediately. This guy is so funny and so smart and fun to be around. The problem is he has two penises. I'm kidding. She didn't write that. But he is also a complete and total whore. Oh, Jesus. Crushing it and good for him. But exactly the wrong guy to get hung up on. I knew I liked him too much. I couldn't help it, but I thought I could handle being friends friends with him, and eventually, eventually the feelings would pass. Nah, nah, you can't be around guys like that. This guy's a pussy-getting son of a bitch, right? Dracula would be like, God damn it, that guy's got game, right? I mean, all the, all the ladies love Dracula. He'd come up and start gnawing on their fucking necks, and that was it. Turn them into lady bats, right? Then he'd kick them to the curb, get himself another chick the next day. Um, we started hanging out a lot, at least two or three nights a week. Sometimes he said things that made me think maybe he liked me too. Then on my birthday, we got drunk and had sex. Called it. Oh, Jesus, she says. Let me be clear. He started it. I just didn't stop it, even though I knew it was a bad idea. It's like a little kid. He started it. Um, the worst part is when I woke up the next morning in his bed, in his bed, he was gone. Oh, man. He fled the fucking scene. Bill, the dude shaped hole in the door. What? Told me that he was freaked out. The dude shaped hole in the door. You mean he like literally ran through the door? I think you left some words out or I'm too fucking old to understand. Is that some new slang? Uh, told me he was too freaked out and decided, and I decided to give him some space. He called me four days later. I don't remember the conversation. Well, were you drunk? But he said he'd call me back. That was four months ago. Clearly, he doesn't give a shit. I get that. But I cannot understand how he could be so much in my life and then just never fucking talk to me again. The fuck, dude? The fuck? You sound cool as hell, by the way. The, m- the more immediate problem is that in a few weeks, a mutual friend is having a birthday party and dude is going to be, is going to be there. What the fuck do I do, Bill? How do I face him? Do I confront him? Do I ignore him? I'm bugging out. Please help me. Thank you. And any advice? From- oh, Nia's got a, oh, I wish she was here this week. Um, all right. Here's the deal. All right. This isn't about him. This is about you. All right. Be honest with yourself. You kind of said it. You knew what this guy was. You knew who he was. All right? But he just had that fucking thing. All right? He just had that fucking charisma or whatever. And two year, two years into it, you're drunk. He started it and you went through it the whatever. You know? He got freaked out and confirmed what you knew all the time and he fucking left. All right? Now be honest with me. Do you want to fight that fight? Before you met this guy and you fantasized about the man you were going to marry, was this how it was going to play out? Was this, is this something that you want to fucking deal with? You realize you're going to have to, like, trying to bring this fucking fish in, the amount of heartache, the amount of extracurricular activities and all that fucking shit that comes along with a guy like this. Well, why would you do that? Why would you do that to yourself? You don't need this shit. All right? The problem is, is you're trying to like, you're trying to like figure out the sanity in somebody's insane behavior. Okay. You knew what he was and then he confirmed it. And now you're like, does he mean this? Does he do that? How could he just do that? Cause he's a fucking lunatic. He's a lunatic. Who knows? Because his dad ran around on his mom. Because his mom took off on his dad. Who the fuck knows? Because of his bullshit. His giant truckload of fucking bullshit. Okay? That he has still not even begun to deal with. Which is why he's behaving like that around you. You don't fucking need that. Jesus Christ. All the guys in the fucking world. Go to the party and have a good time. 
just tell him. Just, you know, if you see him, just say, what's up? No need to be weird. Okay? It's over. Whatever. We, we had a good time. It's fucking over. I knew you were nuts, and now you confirmed it, all right? Stop fucking looking at me like you're seeing a ghost. Like, I just... I would just go there and have a good time. I wouldn't ignore him. I wouldn't confront him. I would just say hello. And then I would go on with having... If he wants to talk, talk to him. If he doesn't, just go on with having a good time. If you bump into him again, say hello again. But don't let that fucking guy ruin your good time. All right? And quit fucking wasting mental time trying to figure out his bullshit. He's not worth it. Fuck him. All right? There you go. Fuck him. Hey, who knows? You might meet Mr. Right at that place. Ooh, oh, this could be the everlasting love. Uh, documentary suggestion. Uh, dear Billy Boo, if you haven't seen the documentary on Netflix about the Ukraine revolution, you should definitely check it out. I would love to see that. Um, it's called Winter on Fire. That sounds like a really bad 80s song. Winter on fire. What was that? St. Elmo's fire. I can fight some fucking Russians. I don't like Vladimir Putin. Uh, I'm sorry. In the immortal words of Ron Burgundy, wow, that escalated quickly. My singing or the, uh, the documentary, it starts with some activists deciding to congregate in one place, which started as an event sent out on Facebook and ended up replacing their president. <laughs> Every time I read shit like this, like I am amazed at the human spirit and also feel so fucking lucky that I haven't had to experience that in a country, you know, uh, in the country I live in, we haven't gone through some shit like that. Hopefully it'll never fucking happen because I don't think I could stomach it. You know, hearing people running up and down the street and you're just sitting there in the house. Who's in charge? <laughs> um, the idea is so foreign to us. And I think most people don't understand just how crazy it is. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't. I'm trying to wrap my head around it. But you are really good at seeing crazy shit no one notices that is right under our noses. So I think you'll be floored by this. Thanks and go fuck yourself. Well, thank you for the uh, the recommendation. I will definitely try to uh, check that out as soon as I can. Is that all the shit? Is that all the fucking... What am I up to here? 58 minutes and 56 seconds. I think I can bullshit for another minute and call this a goddamn day. Was there something else that I had to talk about here on the podcast? Um, oh, yeah. I decided... Uh, I ran into a buddy of mine, and he uh, told me his New Year's, New Year's resolution was he wasn't going to argue with his wife this year. And he's made it all the way to February. And I was like, you know what? That's a really cool resolution, and I haven't made any this year. So um, I'm not giving up arguing with my wife uh, for two reasons. One, it would destroy my act. And two, I'm a selfish son of a bitch. Uh, plus, I have no control of my fucking emotions. I don't. It's, it's shameful, but I don't. Um, so I decided instead I, I'm, I'm going to I'm trying to get back into learning French. Uh, I feel like as I'm, I'm approaching, you know, the mid century mark here, if I don't fucking do it now, I'm going to be fucked. I'm never going to learn how to do it. Um, so I'm fucking I'm back into it. I'm on Duolingo. I've done it three days in a fucking row. And the only reason why I'm announcing it to you guys is because yeah, if you don't hear me talking about it, please break my balls and say that I fucking quit again. I'm a loser and all that type of shit. All that wonderful positive shit that you guys can say anonymously on the Internet. Um, oh, by the way, you know, you know, it's funny in this fucking business, like they never tell the performer shit. Right. So I'm on stage this weekend. I got to ask if there's any doctors out there. I'm fucking on stage and I'm doing my act. I don't even know what night it was. It might've been the first show last night. And the whole time I'm doing my act, everything I fucking say, some guy in the crowd is just like repeating it or commenting on it. You know what I mean? Like, not like heckling. It's more like, like black church, like call and response. I was like, yeah, you know, I was walking down the street the other day and he's just like, yeah. Walking down the street, you know, doing that shit the whole fucking time. But he's not so loud that the rest of the crowd can hear it. So I'm hoping if I just ignore him, he's going to stop. And he doesn't. And finally, after like a half an hour, I was like, dude, will you shut the fuck up? You don't have to fucking comment on everything. He's like, all right, all right, all right. He's just doing that shit. But I love you. It's like saying shit like that. 
And, you know, I was trashing him and all that shit. So afterwards, I ended up meeting him after the show, and he ended up telling me that he had Tourette's. And then somebody on the show goes, yeah, yeah, he had Tourette's. We didn't know if you should throw him out. It's like, why don't you fucking tell me that before I make a fucking ass out of myself? I felt terrible. But here's my question. Is that a form of Tourette's? I thought Tourette's is either you're, you're cursing your brains out or you make weird noises or you, you, you do some sort of physical tick. I didn't know that you fucking all of a sudden were doing that. You know, I'm in a Baptist church, you know, except doing it in a way that eggs on the fucking speaker. It actually annoys the shit out of it. Well, maybe that's my temperament. I have no idea. Um, that's my question for somebody out there in the medical field. Is that a uh, form of Tourette's or was he just trying to uh, make me feel bad? I'm literally yawning here like a fucking idiot. Um, all right. That's the podcast for this week. Oh, biz, Billy, no booze bag. He's back on the fucking wagon again. Um, I got to tell you, as much as I fucking go up and down with that shit, at least I, I do nip it in the bud, you know? I uh, I just drank too much. What was it? Friday night. Woke up fucking hungover. Tired as shit. I was just like, what the fuck am I doing to myself? This is stupid. And um, then I watched Black Mask, and I was watching them drinking Budweiser's in 1970s pull tab cans. And I was like, God, I miss that. I miss it already. All right. All right. That's the podcast for this week. Sorry uh, it was so late. Um, All right. Go fuck yourselves. I'll talk to you on Thursday.